with you afterwards. Uh, my name is uh, Valeria, and um, today I'm uh, co-hosting the session together with Nick. And as you see, uh, I have a bit uh, different setup. As Nick called me, I'm a, a blogger uh, facilitator today, uh, but it is what it is, so <laughs> we will proceed like that. And um, I'm happy to uh, to introduce our first uh, Thought Lab session in uh, 2024. Um, just for those who uh, join for the first time, uh, um, the concept of Thought Lab is the space where we meet with, uh, uh, with subject matter experts who share uh, a relevant topic and uh, also the guests uh, who would like to uh, share how L&D works uh, in their team. Um, and we are here today with, uh, with Nick and Nick will uh, uh, We'll dive to the topic of a decentralized future for L&D. Uh, Nick is part of GTM team at Asana. That's also the platform we're using for today's session. Uh, Nick is based in uh, Stockholm and also serves as a CEO for a nonprofit uh, consulting company. So Nick, uh, no more delays and uh, let's begin. Thank you very much, um, Valeria. Um, and nice to meet you all. If you if you are in a position to turn on your cameras, that's great. It makes it a bit more exciting for me to not look at holograms of of nobodies in a in a call. But I guess it's the internet. We also would have introduced the session with uh, apparently Valeria's favorite Coldplay song, "Viva la Vida," but I realized we couldn't play the sound. But you can sort of like imagine what it would be to have Viva La Viva, Viva La Vida playing in the background as we introduced. So not the best, but uh, hopefully you can imagine. But uh, as Valeria also mentioned, uh, very nice to meet you all. So my name is uh, Nick. I wanted to put the two <laughs> not nationalities as I'm not from Sweden, but uh, the two places that I've called home for the last couple of years. I'm originally from, from Greece. I was born and raised in Athens, but uh, Life took me to Sweden, where I've been living for the last uh, four years in the darkness and cold, but of course it's a fantastic and very, very beautiful country. And uh, today I will talk a lot about my experience uh, leading a global nonprofit uh, called 180 Degrees Consulting, where L&D has been at the core of, of our operations and how we're thinking about upskilling our people. So I'm hoping today to share a lot of my experiences on how we've approached learning and development in a global charity and hopefully we can all share learnings together and have a valuable and exciting conversation on well what it is in Stockholm on Monday afternoon uh, but before then so just some house rules so um, we're using uh, Sana Live as a, as a tool to, to facilitate it uh, so we try to make the session quite interactive so we'd also appreciate if you engage quite a lot I don't want to talk for too much uh, I know you're all very expert uh, professionals in the field so we'd also appreciate a lot of your insights and thoughts but before we get started and talk about the agenda we thought we want to do a short introduction and a short poll so you can actually click this is an interactive poll uh, in terms of what is your vibe this uh, morning afternoon evening it seems that most of us are afternoon or morning so which of the three dogs uh, best represents who, how you're feeling today? It seems to be an overall good balance uh, between uh, the left and the right dog. Uh, I'm always more leaning to the right because I'm an introvert. So I struggle to express strong emotions, be it very positive or negative emotions. So the dog on the right is the one that is best representative of my mood throughout the day usually. And also, I mean, a lot of you posted it, uh, so maybe we can skip this exercise. But um, yeah, like, uh, where are you calling uh, in from, actually? Maybe your role, location, and your favorite food. I thought this is maybe a nice uh, icebreaker. So what is your role in the respective company that you work in? Location, we found out indirectly from the chat, but also your favorite food. So as a Greek myself, I'll probably say my favorite, my favorite food is a little bit controversial because uh, as a Greek, I don't like feta or olive oil, olive, olive, uh, olives, which is a bit of a weird one. It's actually French fries with um, fried eggs. It's the food that my mom used to make when I was young. So it's a very weird <laughs> food that I've chosen. And I love, uh, Emmy that you talked about pasticcio. I don't know if you did that to appease me as a speaker or you actually do like that. For those of you that don't know, pasticcio is a very traditional Greek dish that uh, you used to eat a lot at home. Nice to meet you, Karina. 
uh, learning and development, associate vice president, favorite food pizza, anything potato related. Very nice. Love pizza, young lives versus cancer as people development manager. Spaghetti carbonara, watermelon. <laughs> Valeria, really? I mean, why not, I guess, but uh, that's, uh, could do a little bit more. Um, Paul de Gesher, Raquel, I know, I know, that's uh, really good. Mango, cocoa puff cereal, chicken curry with rice. That's amazing. But thanks a lot uh, very much uh, for sharing, everyone. It's exciting. I'm glad that there is one at least uh, that likes some Greek food, which is great. So what I thought uh, I wanted to share with you today, so the learning objectives, is understand the complex but also very exciting nature of running learning and development in a large global organization. I hope to be able to present the complexity of our organization and why L&D is at the core today and get you to start thinking if you work in some more complex organizations, the possibilities that L&D can bring but also the complexities. And then we also want to share today is how we actually approach building a knowledge sharing culture, in our case, in the global organization that we operate in. But in your case, it could be across different teams, different offices, different entities, et cetera, and the benefits that we are seeing as we're going through this process. And then finally, how do we think about the role of technology? For us as a charity, it is, of course, extremely important given we're resource poor, but for all of you, it might be in a different uh, concept. But in order to help uh, contextualize uh, the complexity, but also the exciting possibilities, I thought to give you a short introduction about what our global nonprofit does. So 180 Degrees Consulting, which I represent, is the world's largest university-based consultancy for nonprofits and social enterprises. So in short, what we do at 170 universities across the world, many of which are in countries and cities that you're present in, like in uh, New York, Amsterdam, Stockholm, uh, et cetera. Um, but basically at a university, we have a, global, a small team, usually around 50 to 100 people that set up a student club and they run local consulting projects with nonprofits. Uh, it's a win for students that get a chance to develop their skills, improve communication, consulting skills, analytical skills, leadership. And it's also a win for the local nonprofits that get a chance to receive either pro bono or low bono support. As a result of that, the mission is both, it's what we call in 180 our dual mission. We want to both empower the nonprofits that are part of our, of our network and the social enterprise to achieve their full potential by providing them with high quality consulting support. And at the same time, our vision, and this is really core with LND, of course, that we'll talk about in a second, to really nurture the next generation of social impact leaders. And that's where LND comes at the core, as we have a population of very young and talented students that are about to enter in the future of the workforce and need to be upskilled in terms of uh, their consulting and other skills. And here I thought the uh, context behind which we'll talk about LND is our global presence and why developing a learning and development ecosystem can be quite complex. So just some numbers to maybe give you the extent. So we have 170 independent chapters of our operations. So these are chapters in ind individual branches. So for example, in Amsterdam at the University of Amsterdam, uh, as an example, and they all operate in 30 countries across the world. So the operations are also global from Australia to New York, uh, sorry, to the United States, to Brazil, etc. And we are also, if you can see here as examples, like present quite in different countries, etc. So here are some examples, uh, our chapter at the University College London, in Amsterdam, in Antwerp, in Singapore, in India, in Taiwan. So that is, I give you an example, and at any point in time, we have a network of six and a half to seven and a half thousand students that are being upskilled through the work that we do. And these are the students that require a lot of support and a lot of learning and development opportunities. So why is LND important in achieving our mission? So why are we investing a lot of time and effort and why are we putting it at the forefront? So and this could be a good exercise. Probably a lot of you might have done this exercise in your respective organizations. But for us, it's at the core of our mission. So when we look back at our mission statement, when we were founded as a nonprofit, it's really at the core. It's nurturing the next generation of social impact leaders. And this is directly linked with professional development and hands-on opportunities. 
our founder, when our organization was set up, he used the words donating with our minds, meaning we use our own minds and our own knowledge to donate to the local communities. And as a result, we are a knowledge organization. Basically, we exist because of our people, and the smarter and more upskilled our people are, the more impact we achieve in our communities. At the same time, we're also a very young organization in terms of the people that we uh, uh, we well employ as volunteers, because they're usually 18 to 23 year olds, and they require a lot of upskilling opportunities. Because probably many of you have been an 18 to 23 year old, or you have. They're still very young. They're just about entering university, so the importance of upskilling is really at the core. And the way that we also look at it is we have an impact measurement framework that helps us assess, okay, what is a successful, uh, how do we achieve more social impact in our communities? And at the core of it is the depth of our impact, meaning are we improving or the degree of improvement in the local communities? And that's where also LND comes to the picture. If we can improve the quality of the consulting work that we do across the 1,000 plus projects that we do annually, if we also improve the quality of how our branches are run by empowering the 6,000 plus volunteers that are part of our network, then we are confident we'll improve the social impact of our nonprofit. So therefore, LND is at the core of our operations. Now, what's really exciting here is what do you, what, what might you guess this number is? This is actually one of the most shocking statistics that over the course of the last seven and a half years in my organization, I couldn't fathom how difficult it is to hear that. Can anyone, Valeria, what do you think 80% represents? Could you guess? It links to the importance of LND, I can tell you that. There is a linkage to LND. Eighty percent of um, participants uh, or young organization joined, uh, comparing to the the previous year. Not actually far. So we have an annual turnover of eighty percent of our student base because they're students, and you might have known. What that means is that on a year by year basis, we lose eighty percent of our workforce. I don't know how it might look like in your organization, but it sounds very stressful if every year 80% of your staff are replaced by new ones. What that, in the context of L&D, that means the importance of onboarding and upskilling is heightened. That was one big learning that we've got over the last couple of years where we really need to invest on that component because we lose 80% of our staff on a year by year basis. But before jumping in and talking a bit on the complexities that we've seen, I'm actually very, very curious to hear what challenges have you experienced in running L&D initiatives, ideally working in global or distributed teams or organizations. So you're all very experienced. I'm coming now from the perspective of a CEO, not a chief learning officer or similar. So I'm looking at L&D in my organization from a big picture perspective, trying to understand how can we use L&D to achieve our social impacts and our mission. But I'm very, very curious to hear how you're approaching it in your respective organizations. What challenges have you faced? Because I can imagine it's not simple. Time zones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, uh, I like this. It's so simple, but what an important point that you brought up, Jen. It's um, my team in, uh, in, in the, the executive team. I think we're based in four different time zones. And uh, even coordinating a meeting between New York and Australia makes it impossible. So completely agree. And that's a good example of the failure of a lot of our initiatives where if we want to do a masterclass, for example, similar to like a thought lab session, we lose a whole region of ours every time because they can't join due to time zones. So that's a really good example. Um, let's read. Um, Different level of competence between different partners in different locations. Finding the balance between tailoring and packaging. Very interesting, Sylvia. Do you maybe want to expand upon that if you're comfortable unmuting yourself? If you're there. Maybe you're not there. Okay. You're somewhere else. 
Let's read a bit more. So despite management knowing the need and importance of learning initiatives, getting them to commit to the time required is difficult. You can also upvote, by the way, if you feel that some are resonating with you, feel free to also like thumbs up or uh, do, you know, recognize whatever resonates the most with you. But I think we have aspects of personalization or like the competence of personalizing learning, which we face a lot in our organization because we have newer branches that are just joining our network and then some older, more established branches where they've been operating for like 10 plus years. So we face a very similar challenge in that sense. Scalable L&D initiatives, which should target uh, different target groups, but also uh, not have a lot of maintenance work. I agree. Personalization at scale, 100%. Localization challenges, that's a really good point, uh, Emmy. No one size fits all can approach, uh, can, pro can work. And we have exactly the same, even the, the language challenges, where a large subset of your audience speaks Hindi, Spanish, uh, you know, or or of course English and French, so it makes it quite difficult. Um, developing a learning experience that is specific, but also generalized enough to be relevant to a diverse audience. Does anyone maybe want to voice over, if you're comfortable, anyone that has an opinion that they also want to share in, um, in, <laughs> in talking rather than just me talking? Is anyone comfortable voicing? Don't be shy, I'm not uh, aggressive. Yes, Jen. You can raise your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, a lot of what people are putting is resonating with me. I mean, we have um, an onboarding programs where we also have lead manager orientations and things like that, where there's a lot of guidance and content that is relevant for the group, but we, it's hard to customize or um, personalize those programs because it's such a broad large group of people so how so i you know i really like that when people put kind of um you know that balance between tailoring the packaging we do an off-the-shelf package but still mm -hmm. find a way that it feels customized about people mm -hmm. um, make that experience a little bit more personalized yeah completely agree and it's difficult to do it at scale and constantly updating i think one thing that we also learned is we build a lot of materials that after a year are outdated because things change, especially our consulting training changes quite fast with how rapidly uh, consultant, uh, consulting uh, changes around us. Um, but I think it's really, really interesting. Thank you very much for sharing. I completely empathize with a lot of them. And uh, it's, uh, it's certainly a challenge. I would also add, which I'll talk about in a second, is it's very, very difficult to find like a process that works for all. So it's almost like you have to compromise sometimes and say, you know, we can't solve all of the problems or we can focus on a couple and be really good at, uh, at some. But thanks all for sharing. And we'll revisit that afterwards when we talk about, about the approach and how you're approaching in a similar case for your organizations. And I also see seeing is believing. So this is, uh, I want to share actually how we currently deliver L&D in our organization and quite practically because this is our current process. And now we're going, this year is the year where we're actually building a knowledge sharing ecosystem. So we are about started already from January. But the tools that we've used historically to deliver L&D in our audience are, as you probably see, very, very basic. So we've used Google Drive for file storage. We used tools like Zoom and Google Meets for online masterclasses. And we used Monday.com, which is a, a project management slash resource ERP tool for promoting certain resources. I'll show you an example of how they actually look like, so you have an idea of why they're not particularly exciting. So I was looking through our Google Drive, and uh, those of you, I mean, I'm sure you've seen Google Drives are, first of all, not easy to access. I honestly, it took me some time to figure out where we host our training material, and I'm the CEO of my charity, let alone a new joiner in uh, a local branch finding that information. So this is an example of all of our consulting training material, which is, to be fair, structured pretty well, like presentation and Excel training, our seven-step consulting framework, et cetera. But one might say, is this really accessible? Will anyone ever open them? I, I doubt myself. And to be fair, we also don't know because we can't track at all what is happening. So this is where we host and all the, um, the, the, the material that we have. This is an example of our masterclasses. 
So we host around eight to 12 masterclasses a year to our global audience. And whilst they're very engaging when we host them, it only is relevant for a certain subset of our population. A time zone example that you brought up uh, before, it's very difficult for us to bring a huge members of our community because, well, if we host it at a European time zone, the Australians will not join or the uh, members in India won't join and uh, vice versa. And then, of course, what happens after the session? Nobody watches the recordings. Nobody really accesses anything after. So in this case, the impact is very, very limited, but takes us a lot of time to actually develop these because one masterclass will probably take hours for us to do because it's a lot of preparation. And this is an example of how we promote resources. So we use a tool which is at the core of our operations called Monday.com. So we have a board, imagine, um, like that, where we have a lot of our resources there for ease of accessibility and promotion. So wherever we want to say, hey, check out this new resource that we've built for you, we post it on Monday.com, link it to the Google Drive, and say, hey, check this out. Again, as you can imagine, is this really the best way to deliver learning and development? I would probably say not. And that has been sort of our go-to for the last couple of years. And hopefully you'll realize that these are not the most uh, exciting ways of delivering. But actually, before going into what challenges we've identified is, what tools do you currently use to deliver L&D initiatives in your organization? Is it what tool stack do you actually utilize at the moment? <laughs> I hope. I hope it's a little bit more advanced than what we use, or at least it's not that level of sophistication that we have. <laughs> okay, Miriam, you're very advanced, very advanced. I hope we were that advanced. Articulates, LMS, LXP, SharePoint, and Confluence. That's awesome. Microsoft Teams, SharePoint, Gen. You're more in our neighborhood. That's great. That's great. Uh, Rise360, Camtasia, SharePoint, Teams. Great. So it seems like you're using quite a lot, a lot around PowerPoint, which is, which is interesting. Notion, which is uh, also very good as a knowledge base. SharePoint, Menti, Neural, Padlet. A lot of, re a lot of tools. My God. So a lot of tools. Miro, excellent. But I can see also quite a lot of diverse like tooling, meaning some that are quite like end-to-end, -end, meaning quite extensive, and some that like are more specific, like you know, use just storyline for authoring and then maybe we deliver that in another way. But very, very interesting to see. Seems to be quite like the two camps almost. One very end-to-end -end and consideration across the board, and the others. Probably like us, where our journey has just started on that front. Perfect. Thank you very much for, for sharing. So what are the complexities that we have identified in creating and distributing content and why we want to go down the path now of actually building a knowledge sharing ecosystem? So the first one is, and again, hopefully this is self-explanatory. I mean, it is lack of engagement. When we build such materials and post them on Google Drive, Nobody really engages with them. So we have high engagement upon release, usually if we host a session or if we post it. But then after that, the engagement drops to almost zero. And we spend hundreds of volunteers' annual hours uh, annually on these. And considering how valuable our volunteer hours are, given that it's limited, it makes it very inefficient for the use of our time. The second is that we really struggle tracking the impact and engagement of our learning initiatives. So when we prepare our impact report, or we present our annual report to the board, we actually struggle to, to say to them, how do, what did we do when it comes to learning and development? And it's, we just use the numbers from our masterclasses a lot of the time and say, we brought together 300 people across 10 masterclasses to say that we've had positive impact on our learning initiatives. But that's very limited because we are a population of six and a half thousand. So that's not really measuring the actual impact and engagement of all of our learning initiatives. The third one is, and those of you that host events probably know, including this one, where the audience is 25 people, delivering live sessions is very complex and time consuming in a global environment because it takes you a lot of time to prepare, it takes you a lot of time to promote them, and then at the end of the day, you tend to have limited impact. 50 people, 70 people, 100 people end up attending of an audience of 6,000. 
So is this a good use of your time? Probably not, if you want to scale. Now, last but not least, is also recognition as an organization that it's difficult to scale L&D as we scale our presence with the current tools we have in place. And we have, a hopefully, an ambitious goal to reach 200 branches very, very soon. So if we as an organization want to double our impact, we have no way that we can scale learning and development with the current tools that we have in place. So it basically restricts us, and we recognize that quite a lot this year. So those are sort of the context behind which we started thinking about building a knowledge sharing ecosystem. And the way that we're approaching this exercise and how we've started already from last year, so we've progressed quite a lot in this work, and this year is the actual execution, which is really exciting, is that we took a step back and said, okay, what do we need to do in order to build an ecosystem where our branches are active participants in building content for our organization? So first step is really understanding the landscape. So we did last year, we did a global survey of all of our branches, and we tried to understand what is it, I think the color should be slightly different here, um, what is it that the challenges that they have in terms of learning and development that we can address, but also identify the skill gaps. What is it that they need uh, more support on, and therefore we should start building as a starting point. So it was quite extensive, and actually it emerged that L&D is at the core of their needs. And of course, since we're not really meeting them at the moment, that was a clear call for us in the executive team to start doing something about it. And then we also looked internally in our global team and said, okay, from our uh, branches perspective, these are the skill gaps that they have and these are the requirements. We also had to look here at our global team and see, okay, what is the current landscape? What are the existing L&D resources that we have? We had a couple of programs. We had a couple of courses that we've built. What are we actually missing? What are the existing tools that we use and their drawbacks? So what things should we continue using and what should we remove? And also, how many people do we need to reach our objective? Because we are a very small team. We're approximately 90 people in our global team. So we have to use our resources wisely, especially since all of us are volunteers. Like none of us are getting paid for this work. So we have to be very strategic as to how we approach it. Now, this, the second part was around the vision and prioritization. So we had to think, okay, if we take a step back, we need to make sure that this initiative is in line with our vision. And we had to set a very, very clear vision. So we wanted to ensure that us spending hundreds of hours on this is really going to help us reach our uh, social impact. So our idea was if we are to successfully build a knowledge sharing ecosystem, it will help us upskill thousands of our consultants annually, which will then allow us to deliver high quality projects in our local communities and in turn expand the impact of the organizations we serve. So it became a very clear reason for us to invest a substantial amount of resources, time and effort in order to make this happen. And it was also really easy for us to connect with our board who was very supportive of that decision as we went along with it. Alongside that, we invested what should be the prioritized use cases as we roll out the knowledge sharing ecosystem. What is it that we need to do uh, in order to have the most impact as a start? Like the I would say big bang of, of, a, of a priority. And where we said that is we had some basic prioritization criteria. We said, we know we need to focus on the areas where the learning gap is the greatest, where the success of those use cases will be extremely important for us, but also where we're actually not starting from zero. Because at the end of the day, we don't have as much time to build everything from scratch. And as a result, with this prioritization framework in mind, we decided to focus on the new branch onboarding as a new priority. Basically, all our branches that are joining our network year on year uh, as a starting point. And after that, which is where we are at the moment, we are basically at the pilot stage. So we're now in a process where we're basically trying to pilot with a small number of our branches and our global team members, trying to really focus on the use cases that we've identified, having enough geographical coverage, and then establishing some clear evaluation criteria such that for us, the hope is by September, we can actually make an informed decision about a global rollout, which would be quite big for a charity to roll out a new global technology solution in our network. So that's sort of how we've approached it. And it has been quite a long process for us, trying to step back and trying to understand 
how this will look like. And I want to actually share how will this ecosystem look like? So how have we built it in order to realize the benefits that we want? So our vision is, and maybe this resonates with how many you've set it up and in line with some of the challenges that you've identified. So our vision is that as a global team, we would have what we call some mandatory top-down learning programs. These are programs that we feel are mandatory and in line with what we expect our network to have to learn in order to perform well their operations. So that includes a lot of programs around onboarding of new branches, new presidents, and where the personalization is really key. Global masterclasses that we still believe are really valuable for us because it brings a sense of community, but also a lot of compliance related training and documentation. We have a big tech stack uh, that we require brands to use, but also be legally compliant in their local communities. And those are the ones that we believe are going to form the foundation of what our global team will provide. Then our vision and what our real hope is, is our branches creating their own content. So giving them a tool where they can, on their own, start building their own content for the local branch. And the vision there is that they already have the infrastructure set. And this could be the case for your respective teams or offices. They have, in our jargon, a consulting director that is their main responsibility is to organize and deliver training at a branch. So they are an L&D professional for all intents and purposes. And what we would we do is giving them a tool saying, hey, now use this tool to build content that is relevant for your local branch. And our vision there is that the localization of content by assigning that consulting director from branch X to do it will help increase relevance, quality, and engagement of training in local branches. But what this enables us to do afterwards is having visibility of all the content that our branches will produce. For us, it's really crowdsourcing all the high quality relevant material globally. And that's where we as a very short staffed global team that are volunteers will leverage the 6,000 plus network that we have to really find the best training globally to scale globally. So the idea here and our vision is we'll identify the most popular trainings in each region, in each country that will be eligible for a global rollout. And then we can also co-create content with those consulting directors or branches that are investing substantial L&D. So allowing us to say, okay, you're doing really well in New York. Why don't you help us create a global program on a particular topic? All at the same time, our vision is still to maintain our central L&D team, coordinating and knowing our global strategy. So we currently have an L&D team in place uh, that has been operating for the last seven years. So the central lending team team will still play a very key role in the quality control and the standardization that is required to ensure the quality of the programs that we deliver to our branch network is in line, but also to have guidelines to our branches to say these are the best practices of building a course on consulting skills 101 or others to make it very, very clear. So these are sort of the ways that we've thought about how does a knowledge sharing ecosystem look like? So it solves some of our biggest problems because we are very short staffed, meaning at which point we can't really do much. Like our team is six people that are volunteering seven to eight hours a week. So there's as much as we can do in terms of content, but it also addresses one big problem that we have, which is localization. As a global team, we struggle to figure out what the best needs for each of our branches are. So we have to maintain that balance of mandatory, but at the same time, giving most of the tools to our branches to do their own thing. And then us, from our perspective, trying to outsource uh, most of that work to them. But I'm actually very curious here and seeing from your perspective, if you've gone down an exercise like this, what benefits have you seen? If you've tried in your organization, it could be across your teams in a company, it could be across different offices, it could be across even like individuals, but placed in different parts. What benefits have you seen trying to build a knowledge sharing ecosystem? What is it that you've identified has, has seen like really good benefits if you've gone through this exercise?
no duplication of learning material, closer collaboration between teams, higher engagement and less frustration. Really good. Thanks for sharing, Emmy. Also, I really like the uh, closer collaboration. This is one thing that we recognize as well, the importance of collaboration between our branches as well. They've always been telling us about this, how they want us to, they, they want to work together and, and collaborate. And this could be a great avenue for it. I agree. Centralized and lean approach. Content was tailored and fitted mostly different target groups. Agreed. Really good point, Miriam. Learning communities that we call birds of a feather, which focus on sharing best practices and knowledge sharing. That's awesome. And is that, uh, Jen, like you have like different communities across the world and then they all like share and then there's a central way of doing it? Or how does that community look like? So a lot of them started out kind of grassroots and um, groups will get together. So we have um, people who might work on documentation or things like that might have to work with other where they're working cross-functionally with other people who do uh, training documentation. They share their best practices as well as groups who might focus more on um, awesome. uh, specific things. Or they, they, there are different topics. Mm -hmm. Awesome. No, that's really good to, uh, to hear. I like the idea of like really grassroots. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, extremely, extremely important. Um, but thank you very much for sharing. And I'd say for us, the key learnings that we've had so far in this exercise that are driving us forward is number one, having really a clear vision in line with a broad strategy of why I want to do this is very important. The reason is we work with volunteers and mobilizing volunteers around this becomes extremely important. So we build our strategy for the last two years, uh, next, uh, next years around people development and really upskilling our people. And our membership is now very much in line about the importance of investing in this. So us going down this path becomes very natural. And therefore, it's easy for us to proceed and, and go down investing a lot of time and effort into this. I think the second for us, which we talked a lot about, like for organizations like 180 Degree Consulting, but actually for many, that are global in presence, like we really, really benefit from crowdsourcing content due to challenges in localization. I think that's, we really cannot underestimate the importance of crowdsourcing when it comes to localization, because we will never be able to produce really high quality content that's tailored to everyone. So for us, it's giving people the tools to do their own thing, build content that is fit for the local communities and us taking inspiration and insights from them to scale globally. We recognize that we actually want, at a central team, solve the problem at all. And it's sort of like putting the problem on the actual local branch to solve it for them and us taking the benefits afterwards for a global level. The third is, it's the only way for us to scale L&D, at least for a charity where we don't have millions to invest. If I'm transparent, we are quite budget constrained. It's the only way that we've identified if we want to scale learning and development and be able to provide personalization at scale. It's the only way that we can scale high quality content. Uh, so if you're in this context where you feel that we're struggling when it comes to scaling, finding a way to crowdsource content in a very seamless and structured way can be a really good way to scale. And that's one of our biggest bets in terms of seeing how this experiment plays out in one or two years. The fourth one is the importance of though having a central team. We realize that if there is no structure at the central level, meaning have an L&D team at our HQ, which in our case is a global team operating online, with clear guidelines, clear like mission and vision, you will not have high quality across the board. So the importance of having that team, we realize is paramount because we are considering, should we actually not even have an L&D team in our global team? Does it make sense? And we sort of reverted and said, actually, it's extremely important. So we should not get uh, rid of that team, actually invest uh, more in it. And last but not least, for us as a charity, technology is a huge enabler of our vision. I'm not gonna lie, without tech as a global nonprofit, we would be able to achieve one fifth of our goal, purely because of the limited resources that we have. We are, again, volunteers, most of us. So without technology, we wouldn't be able to achieve our vision. And that's sort of the last thing I wanna talk about. How are we thinking about technology in this context and how we're considering what tools do we need in order to achieve our mission because it takes a lot of effort for us as a nonprofit to roll out a 
technology solution, <laughs> to be transparent. And that is very, very difficult. So how are we approaching this very complex problem that I know many of you have faced uh, yourselves in order to address the core issue at hand, which is building a knowledge sharing ecosystem? Now, those of you that have worked in nonprofits will hopefully empathize with me that it's a catalyst. And I find it a shame, having worked with hundreds of nonprofits in my lifetime, that they underappreciate the importance of tech. They don't think about it as important to leverage it in the operations to scale. But ultimately, and again, this could be for organizations that are budget constrained or similar. For us, it's a catalyst, number one, because we have limited financial resources to manage complex and administrative tasks. I, I can't convince my volunteers to do <laughs> global program administration. <laughs> they will say, sorry, Nick, bye, not exciting for me. So we can't really empower them to do something like that because it's a boring thing to do. And imagine doing that at scale. We need a technology solution to do that or at least to optimize it. The second is that we have just limited time. We can't, don't have enough time to spend doing administrative tasks, at which point, if we want to actually do cool stuff, we need technology solutions to do so. The third is that we also lack uh, a lot of knowledge. Many of our volunteers are relatively young individuals that are not capable of handling complex manual systems, which in the context of an L&D knowledge sharing ecosystem is necessary. So we actually wouldn't have the capabilities to do so. And finally, the ability to help nonprofits to scale their operations without corresponding scale of people, time, and financial resources. Again, of course, one might say, hey, Nick, why don't you hire 2x the number of volunteers? <laughs> well, sure, but then would that actually achieve anything? Well, probably not. And we tried that exercise and failed massively, meaning we didn't do 2x anything, actually, because culture doesn't scale 2x if you bring 2x number of people. I want to give an example of the impact of technology for our own profit. So one of the tools that has been really beneficial for us is Monday.com. It's the tool that we use our global brand our branch network. I'm not going to talk about Monday.com. It's what it has enabled us to do. It took us two and a half years to roll out. That's how long uh, technology implementation takes in a global nonprofit. So yes, if you are planning on rolling out a global tech solution, it takes time. That I can tell you. We underestimated the amount of time that it took. But after two and a half years, we are now there, which is amazing. But basically, it has been an enabler of three key things, which I'm really proud about. And we are actively pushing also to other nonprofits to focus on. The first one is it has really enabled to automate core processes to save time. Again, this might seem really basic, but the fact that now we have a tool that automates sending invoices, that automates recruitment, that automates things like that, that our members really dislike doing, is really cool because they, our volunteers, can spend time doing things that are actually exciting, like organizing an event or launching a new initiative. The second thing is there is that it has enabled us to build new initiatives to scale our impact using the technologies that we have. So with Monday.com, it took us a year to upskill our population to be in a state where they're now like, oh, but can we not do this and automate this process or launch this initiative with Monday.com? So it gets our members to start thinking, oh, but I can actually do this initiative and that initiative and that initiative, surely because of the technology stack that we have. And the third, it makes volunteers happy or it makes people happy because who likes doing tasks or who likes doing administration? I hope none of you do. It's uh, one of the most boring things that uh, you can think about. And uh, volunteers especially don't like doing it because they're volunteers and they're here to learn not to do sending out invoices 10 every day. <laughs> no, 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 no. So that's like an enabler. And we've been extremely proud that we've been able to pull off such a big tech transformation for a nonprofit and why we're excited about the next stage of this transformation with an L&D uh, platform. And for us, the way that we're approaching this is we have to think about some key factors because again, it takes us so much time and effort that we really need to think carefully which tools are fit for purpose for our organization. It can't be that we just YOLO an initiative because it's, it's such an investment that we have to spend our time very thoughtfully. So for us, the factors are usually across three segments, and this is across all tools that we usually use. Is it easy to use? And does it have a good user experience? Because our members are really young 
and tend to also not like complex things because <laughs> young people don't like complex uh, tools in general, though you might have realized. Is it easy to scale and is it easy to overall administer? I could I get someone who is 23 and tell them how to use this tool in a very easy way without hours and hours of training? And actually, does it address the requirements that we've set for that particular tool and the budget? <laughs> we don't have millions to spend. We usually get huge nonprofit discounts to make this possible. So is this in line with what we can actually pay? So these are usually the requirements, and that's how we've uh, invested in Monday.com, on our website as well, using Webflow, and how we're now envisioning how, what L&D tool we're going to use. And usually, the process that we undergo, as a sort of a good wrap-up for this whole uh, part, is we spend quite a lot of time, which now we've done, and we're actually in a pretty good state, spending the, documenting our user requirements and shortlisted. And now we're in a process where we're piloting with shortlisted providers. And then we spend quite a lot of time doing regional uh, rollouts before we do a global rollout, which is why it takes us approximately two to two and a half years to have a system uh, globally rolled out. But having this very phased approach across the board ensures that the tech that we invest in is actually the tech that really makes the most impact in our organization. So my advice, having involved in myself in two huge transformation projects with our organization is take your time. Don't rush with making decisions because I can tell you it's a very painful process going back. Like it's. Uh, I'm so grateful that we chose to invest so much time in this rather than rush it because at the end of the day, it is very important that this meets your vision and your requirements. So with our current LMS search, I think we spent over a year in phase one and now we're about to enter phase two that is going to take us another year. So of course, I'm not recommending these timelines for you. We are a nonprofit, but my advice as sort of a wrapping point here is really take your time to thoughtfully consider what is most relevant to you rather than rush, because that has made the world of a difference uh, for us. And on that note, I want to sort of like summarize, I'm conscious of, of the time. I hope this was a good summary of everything I want to talk about. So I hope in the key takeaways that you can take from the session today um, is the importance, but yet complexity of learning and development in achieving the mission of global knowledge organization. So in our discussions today, I hope I gave you an understanding of why l and can be and should be prioritized, but also that it's complex and we should not forget that it's not easy to achieve, but it's worth the time and effort. The second is I hope we gave you some ideas about how we're approaching the building this ecosystem, but also what benefits can it bring to address some of the key challenges that we identified. And lastly, what is the role of technology? Like what is it that technology can do in order to help us get there. And on that note, I'm actually very, very curious to hear your takeaways. Is there anything that you've taken from the session that you can apply in your own respective environments, be it in your professional lives and maybe some of the work that you do outside? What was it that was something that uh, stood out to you from this session? And feel free to be constructive, destructive, anything that comes on, on top of your mind. that we all meet the same challenges. <laughs> exactly. Well, validation, uh, Sylvie, is uh, very important, isn't it? That uh, you're not the only one, that's for sure. Planning is as important as execution, if not more. I completely agree. And there was one example that can give Emmy when we wanted to roll out a new global comms platform. So we decided to roll out Facebook Workplace. And we basically, we didn't do a pilot, we just did it. And we had zero engagement. We actually discontinued it after a year. <laughs> so it was a good example of us rolling a platform without thinking about it and uh, it failed. We just uh, achieved nothing at the end. Um, if you wanna find people who contribute, make it as easy as possible, not only for 23 year olds, but also for others. I agree. Like make it simple stupid is a simple example like if a 23 year old can use it then hopefully everyone else can can use it simplicity is key keeping the vision in mind as you progress completely agree we sometimes think have unique challenges but they're often the same as everyone else indeed 
and affirm to hear how L&D has a place of real importance within the work that you do. Time mindful and tell is more than what we expect. But thank you very much uh, for sharing. And um, as always on a good note, I, I always value everyone's time. So uh, you can uh, do a sliding scale in terms of how valuable you found the session. Is it on the lines of Love is Blind on Netflix was a better use of your time? Maybe you like Love is Blind, I'm not gonna lie. Maybe this is a bit of a controversial statement <laughs> that uh, Love is Blind is actually a valuable use of one's time. Uh, this is my personal assessment. Maybe now I'm going to get some uh, negative comments on the chat saying, Nick, love is blind is the best thing that has happened. So Valeria, come on. <laughs> maybe, maybe. It was my mistake. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So I, I mean, I've triggered some. You know what? I've triggered some. You know, Maybe there are preferences towards love is blind in our tool. Uh, yeah, so Jen, uh, it's uh, Sana Live. So it's a tool that is part of Sana. So it's a virtual classroom uh, tool. Uh, we use. Perfect. Um, but with that in mind, thank you very much all for taking the time. Uh, have a lovely uh, rest of your day. And I know Valerio, is there any closing statement that you want to make? Yeah. Thank you, Nick, for being here with us today and for sharing your uh, strategy and insights. Uh, um, guys, who wants to um, to host our next uh, thought lab? Uh, let me know, and uh, we can discuss the details uh, after the session, or you can also chat, uh, send.